Thank you for coming out. You've heard a lot of cogent analysis here about the maldistribution of power in our country. And I'm not going to run over the same ground, except just to summarize a little bit by way of a predicate. I think we know from our history that every time there's too much power and wealth controlled by the few, that control not only concentrates wealth in private hands, power in private hands, it controls our governments, our state governments, our local governments, our national governments. It controls our elections. It blocks people's access to their own government so they can use it, shape it in their own interest. It uh, allows a takeover of government by corporate interests, something Thomas Jefferson warned about years, years and years ago. And he said the purpose of representative government, quote, is to counteract the excesses of the moneyed interests, unquote. And today the moneyed interests are the corporate interests. In other words, <clears throat> he and others saw representative government as an arm's length correcting, counteracting force against the uh, rampages and, and greed of uh, private economic power. In those days, the merchants, uh, and in our days, the global corporations in particular, who have less and less allegiance to our country as they roam the globe, cutting deals with dictatorships to get repressed labor uh, and other considerations that will lower their costs, and then they ship the equipment over, and then they replace the jobs, and one of their indirect effects is to prop up oligarchies and dictatorships in places like Indonesia, Mexico, and elsewhere. <clears throat> and they really don't have much allegiance to our country other than to control it. And controlling it, they are doing a very efficient job. Oh. Of course, we look around, we see the economy, a booming corporate profits, booming stock market prices, booming executive compensation packages, You've got a man here in Seattle who's worth $18 billion, Bill Gates. And his software isn't even the best. <laughs> but his strategic control of business strategy is extremely clever. And, and he's uh, making it big. He said someday he's going to give it to a foundation and uh, he's going to start giving some of it back. I think some of us would settle for Microsoft and Intel and others paying their fair share of property taxes. <laughs> and the consequences. Here we have booming corporate profits. GMP is going up, not very much, but it's going up. And the business economists are saying the economy is terrific. It couldn't be better. It couldn't be better for them. It couldn't be better for the corporate executives or the top 5% of the people in this country. You're doing really pretty well. But for the bottom 80%, the wages have been declining, adjusted for inflation, by 15 to 20% over the last 20 years. Now, here's a growing economy, and 80% of the workers are losing ground. That has not happened uh, before, except in periods of depression. So we're entering a situation where we've got a two-class society, uh, the people at the top and the corporations at the top are making it out pretty well. And more and more people driven uh, downward, having to work longer to make ends meet, having to go into personal debt, uh, which is now at an all-time high, consumer debt. Personal bankruptcies are all-time high. And they're spending more and more time getting to work, uh, working, uh, and uh, more members of the family are working and the neighborhoods are being abandoned. There's not enough time for civic activity. The children don't have enough time with their parents. Um, this is 1996 America. We're supposed to have uh, abolished poverty. We're supposed to have less and less time committed to making ends meet with all the wealth and technology we have. Instead, uh, many of the workers' demands now in 1996 are eerily similar to what they were demanding in 1886 or 1896. Uh, only 10% of the workforce is unionized in the private sector. And it's pretty hard to form a union now, given how weak the labor laws are, uh, given the ease with the replacement strikers, given the ability of companies to bring workers to their knees if they don't fire them for work trying to organize unions, uh, and by saying, we'll go abroad. We'll just close down the plant. They did that in Louisiana 
a couple years ago, and that was the end of the unionization drive. The workers are making $5.25 an hour, and they thought they, they should make $6.50 an hour. And, and uh, that's what's going on. The middle class is being downsized. The poverty uh, is being preserved and maintained. The safety net is being torn apart. And the two parties, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, Republicans, really look alike parties. That's why their campaign is so cosmetic, because they're basically one party with two heads wearing different makeup. <laughs> And uh, they just uh, aren't solving the problems. They're not even talking about it. You look at the debates between Clinton and Doe, uh, some of the most dreariest, repetitious exchanges known to humankind. <laughs> that first debate was an hour and a half long between Clinton and Doe. It was really a 15-minute debate repeated six times. <laughs> And notice what they didn't discuss because they have no differences on these issues. They're on the side of big business on these issues. So how can they criticize one another? How can they debate? Number one, no discussion of the most powerful unemployment preservation regulatory agency in the country, the Federal Reserve. The Republicans appointed Alan Greenspan chairman years ago, and Clinton just reappointed him, along with two others who are Wall Street approved. No discussion. What happened to energy independence? What happened to renewable energy and solar energy? We're importing half our oil. We're involved in geopolitical problems because of it around the world. And it's not on the table because that's exactly the way the oil companies want it. They got our energy policy where they want it. And the Department of Energy is not doing much for solar and renewable energy. And Al Gore, who was once a big solar energy advocate, has been muzzled. And George Ronald Clinton is content with the status quo. <laughs> Whatever happened to universal health insurance? I mean, if Canada can cover everyone from cradle through nursing home with full choice of doctor and hospital accorded to patients, and they do it on 11% of their economy every year, uh, we're spending 15% this year on health care, $1 trillion plus, and 42 million people do not have health care coverage, including many children, and 20 million are grossly undercovered, and the rest Wondering when they're going to fall through the cracks, under the grip of the giant HMOs, buying up all kinds of hospitals and doctor practices. In my home state of Connecticut, headlines, Hartford Current, drive-through mastectomies, not even one night in the hospital, drive-through births, bringing people to their knees so they can suck up the savings, uh, the corporate executives, up to the top, and pay 10, 15, 20 million dollars to the boss, five, six million dollars to the executive vice president, and on and on. The top 25 heads of the, of the top HMO giants and hospital chains had a net worth from their own business uh, of seven and a half billion dollars. You know, one of them 800 million, another one of envious 600 million, and, and so it goes. Now, the Democratic Party platform didn't even mention universal health insurance this year. They dropped uh, the two platforms, the Republican and Democrat, are utterly cowardly. If they're not cowardly, they're insipid. If they're not insipid, they're tepid. If they're not tepid, they're nothing. They're nothing. They're a disgrace to the tradition of politics in this country. Afraid to take on the central contention of politics, which is the concentration of power and wealth in too few hands, that produces more and more problems and refuses the application of ready-made solutions. You mean we can't have a decent housing stock in this country? You mean we can't get rid of homelessness in this country? You mean we can't have well-nourished children in this country? We can't have energy sustainability in this country? Uh, respecting future generations, respecting the environment, being a model for the rest of the world, decentralizing energy, facilitating consumers and small businesses producing their own energy? Of course we can. You mean we can't, uh, we can't have full employment? Or do we really have to have uh, seven, eight million people out of, out of jobs, another 15 million people with very part-time jobs? Do we really need to tolerate an economy where the fastest growing industries are prison construction, gambling casinos, and temporary employment companies?
I mean, we really can't do anything about gas guzzling motor vehicles. Motor vehicles that still need to be made safer and can. The engineers know how to do it. They know how to make more fuel efficient vehicles. They sure do know how to make more public transit, personalized, modern public transit, where people, instead of cursing each other and clogged arteries on the highway, wasting time getting back and forth to work, breathing the pollution, spending money on accidents and fuel, they could be moving around in exquisite, modern, personalized mass transit that is environmentally benign. Uh, there are a lot of people in this country who are on clogged highways. A lot of people in this country are on clogged highways getting back and forth to work every day. And uh, many of them don't know that in the late 30s and early 40s, General Motors conspired with an oil and tire company, they were later indicted and convicted, uh, to buy up electrified mass transit systems, trolleys. They ripped up the tracks, they pushed for highways so they could sell more buses, more cars, more light trucks, and more fuel, more tires, etc. And so they broke the back of a balanced transportation system which could have uh, respected land use planning, make cities more livable, gotten people to work. Uh, more safety, and I, might, and I might add quickly, I mean, the, the rate of speed on some of these clogged highways is not even in excess of the horse and buggy rate of speed <laughs> decades ago. And so GM was convicted in 1947 uh, in federal district court in Chicago uh, for criminal violation of the antitrust laws. This could be considered one of the economic crimes of the century because every day people are paying, wasting time, wasting fuel, uh, breathing pollution, etc. And you know what GM was fine? This defines what soft on corporate crime means. $5,000. That was their penalty. Now you've heard a lot about corporate welfare. Just a quantitative uh, uh, vignette. Uh, I've checked uh, what Congress was opposed to on a number of issues in terms of funding the last two years under Gingrich Dole and their Democratic collaborators. Largely there's some uh, pretty good people there, but they're in the minority. And they were telling us they don't have $300 million for public broadcasting. They were telling us they couldn't afford $300 million for legal services for the poor. $15 million for more meat and poultry inspectors. They were telling us they couldn't afford $50 million to expand the motor vehicle safety standard research. They were telling us they didn't have $20 million to expand immunization programs for little infants. They were telling us all these things. And that doesn't even add up to one subsidy of the Pentagon for the merger of Lockheed Martin Marietta, which is a billion and a half dollars. Which is a billion and a half dollars, 30 million dollars went to executive bonuses. As Peter Jennings said, that's your money. That's your money. Uh, that's your federal lands where foreign and domestic corporations can go on under the 1872 Act, discover gold or molybdenum or any other hard rock mineral, and they get it free. Uh, well, not quite free. They have to buy the acreage over the mine. So a Canadian company discovered $10 billion worth of proven gold reserves on our land in Nevada, and they uh, certified it, Department of Interior, and they said they wanted 3,300 acres. And they got it for $30,000 or so. I mean, it was a giveaway. Um, that's the price. They could mine the gold, sell the gold, pay nothing back by way of royalties. Foreign countries cut tougher deals with our mining countries. Indonesia, Nigeria, they cut tougher deals uh, than our government does. That's our land. And what are the things that we own but don't control? Just look at that. We legally own the public airways. <laughs> We're the landlords. The Federal Communications Commission is the tenant, is the real estate agent and the TV and radio stations of the tenants. Now the tenants pay us no rent, they get their license free, they make a lot of money, they decide who says what 24 hours a day on TV and radio. They can decide whether this gathering is going to be beamed all over the state of Washington or not. And uh, they can keep us off our own property. We don't have an audience network claiming one hour prime time drive time so we can have our own programming, and producing, etc. Well funded. And uh, why don't we change that situation? If we legally own the airways, why don't we have better access? Why don't we have our own media taking back some of the time uh, under the license process? 
The same with cable. We give cable companies a monopoly license. What do we get in return? Other than headaches and inscrutable bills that we want. Uh, junk programming, and the more channels, the more junk. There's no end to it. Why don't we, for example, say we want a citizen action channel so we can learn with one another? Years ago, Seattle did great work in dealing with contaminated blood problems. That was a problem in cities all over the country. This is over 20 years ago. And the question is, uh, why didn't it spread? Why, well, there wasn't anything uh, by way of a communications media that showed people around the country how people in Seattle did it. Uh, no 800 number, no addresses, no programs on cable TV. Right, because that, that solves the problem. You see, that is constructive citizenship. That doesn't qualify on the late television evening news. You know the motto of the late television evening news around the country? Here it is. If it bleeds, it bleeds. If it stinks, it stinks. <laughs> In other words, look at the late evening news. It starts out with three, four street crimes, and then it moves to a little chit chat and the first preview of the weather. <laughs> and they give you a little tease. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then they have, uh, they have some, uh, something from City Hall, and then they have the sports, and then they have the five-day forecast, and maybe a movie review, and a little bit of chit-chat between the anchors, and that's it. That's it? Is that all that happened in Seattle uh, that night? Not crying, weather, and, and, and sports? This business of legally owning as a commonwealth, we own together as a commonwealth, we don't study about that at school. We don't learn about it. They tell us to study, work hard, graduate, get a good job, own a house, a couple of cars, a little cottage in, in the mountains, whatever, on the beach. They don't tell us, they don't tell us that we own together the greatest wealth in our country. We own the public lands, we own public airways, we own four trillion dollars of pension funds. Uh, the mutual insurance assets are legally owned by the policyholders like Prudential and Metropolitan Life. And we own all the public works, and we don't control any of it. Uh, the pension monies are controlled by the banks and insurance companies in terms of where they're invested. They're invested in the paper economy or mergers and acquisitions that Empire built. Don't produce any new wealth or new jobs except make people at the top and the investment bankers hyper rich. <laughs> And then we're starved for investment in our community, for the real stuff, the real empirical, hands-on investment. The same is true in terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, public lands. We know who controls the public lands, the mining companies, the timber giants, etc. The same is true for the mutual insurance assets. The managers of Prudential and Metropolitan Control, they even shaft their own uh, their own policy others. They got in trouble in a huge uh, a scam. Both companies that had to regurgitate several hundred millions of dollars for once. They got away, they didn't get away with it entirely. And the same is true for our public works. Uh, we have no say about how our highways are even constructed. They're constructed with inferior materials that lead to all kinds of potholes, all kinds of delays, all kinds of maintenance, all kinds of disrepair. When for years there have been ways to build hospitals, uh, to build rather highways that would almost be re repair free. Repair free, you know, six inches and with a, in, in between a, a plastic film that allows the road to breathe, winter, summer, etc. It doesn't buckle. And the uh, problem is it doesn't use as much uh, uh, concrete or asphalt, and uh, the, the uh, industries don't like that. <laughs> and, and so here we are, you know, boom on the axle, thud this and thud that, uh, and spending a lot of our tax dollars repairing instead of putting that money into mass transit that, that can get people around on the ground so efficiently and so much uh, uh, more safely. So we ought to talk about why is it that we <clears throat> legally own these commonwealths uh, but we don't control anything. We should have cable channels devoted to citizen activity, to labor issues, a labor channel, a student channel. <laughs> Instead, we're getting more home shopping channels, more movie and rerun channels. We're going to get a Macy's channel, a GM channel. Uh, and what are we getting for this monopoly right? We give the cable company. 
Now, none of the politicians want to talk about this, of course. They don't want to talk about a lot of things that challenge power. And, of course, that just gets rid of the purpose of politics. I mean, the purpose of democratic politics, small d, is to make sure that power is accountable, that it's not too concentrated, that it doesn't monopolize things, that it doesn't control the government, that it doesn't uh, smash the po uh, fulfillment of human possibilities, that it doesn't wreck the country because the super-rich want to become hyper-rich, uh, that it doesn't corrupt and trivialize the election process, that it doesn't block people from access to their own media, their participation in their own government. I mean, there is a tremendous many out there for all of you, many of you have already worked on it, but we have to ask ourselves, how do we change this? Now, here's my best guess. If a thousand people in the state of Washington decided to forge arms together behind progressive politics. They had a clear understanding of the tools of democracy they, they want to get installed, whether by initiative, by legislation, by judicial action. They looked at the roles that we play in our political economy, or tried to, as voters slash citizens, one role, workers, consumers, taxpayers, and savers, saver investors, like in the SNLs. And they say, you know, most people, regardless of where they're coming from, they think that they're losing control. That they don't have any control whatsoever in those five roles in many instances. For example, their vote is being nullified, trivialized, and corrupted by cash in politics. Seventy percent of the campaign cash to federal elections comes from business interests. And there's always a quid pro quo. There are now 6,400 political action committees pouring money into the coffers of politicians in Washington. 20 years ago, there were 400. You've got them all from the auto dealer action committees to the chicken coop manufacturing political action committees to the uh, drug industry political action committees to the oil company, on and on and on. It's cash and carry. I call it cash register politics. That nullifies your vote. So you're losing control in terms of the meaning of your vote. What about your ability to access government agencies as a citizen? You go to court, and they say you don't have standing to sue. They throw it out. The regulatory agencies are run by, often by appointees who can't wait to finish their on-the-job training and go into the very industry uh, that they're regulating. Fortunately, you have one of the best insurance commissioners in the state here, Deborah Sam. <laughs> Notice again, what, uh, what kind of power do you have uh, as workers to form a union anymore? Those labor laws are so weak, and they're so able to be delayed and obstructed by business and union-busting corporate law firms. And we have a discussion of that in our new book uh, called No Contest, uh, The per uh, Corporate Lawyers and the Perversion of Justice in America. They're dismantling our democracy on behalf of their corporate clients. And it's very difficult to form a union now. You start trying to form a union. So much more difficult in Canada. You form a union, they fire you. It takes you three and a half years for the National Labor Relations Board to reinstate you. And by that time, other workers get the idea. If indeed, they haven't heard from the bosses saying they're going to close down and go to Mexico or someplace if there's a union uh, about to be formed. Now, without unions, and I know, look, we fought union corruption. We don't like the idea of some union leaders uh, stomping on the rank and fire. But overall, the trade unions in the last hundred years expanded greatly the middle class. They gave workers dignity, they gave workers financial security, because they redressed that imbalance of power between the employer and the workers. But there's not much of that anymore. What about the other roles? Let's say consumers. Um, you're supposed to have freedom of contract when you go uh, and engage in installment loan agreement to buy an appliance or a car, or when you buy an auto insurance policy or life insurance policy, or when you open an account in a bank, or when you take out a mortgage. You're supposed to have a freedom of contract, you know, to negotiate the best deal. A, a contract's supposed to be a meeting of the minds between buyer and seller. When was the last time you met the mind of Sears? <laughs> When was the last time you met the mind of any company that basically said to you, sign on the dotted line? The fine print is all written by the lawyers for the company, all one-sided, everything designed to disadvantage you if you have a dispute, 
You often sign off on compulsory arbitration, it strips you of your right to go to court. That's spreading all over the country, whether it's the Bank of America, the HMOs, employers. Uh, and so if you have a dispute, whether it's a laborer or consumer, if you're in a non-union uh, workplace, you're out of business. You've lost your bargaining power. I mean, just show you how crazy this one-sided system of contracts uh, is. Why don't you just reverse it someday? You know, next time you go buy a car or you go buy an appliance, uh, ask the uh, dealer or the clerk to give you the form of the contract. Uh, and, and sit down in an empty chair, get out your magnifying glass, and start reading. See, you just say to the clerk, who would be bewildered by now, not to mention the salesman and the car dealership, you're probably thinking you're a communist. Uh, and you say, look, uh, my, my daddy and mommy told me I shouldn't sign anything I don't read thoroughly, so I want to sit down reading, you're reading it, and there are things you don't like. You knock off the compulsory arbitration clause, you double the warranty, you cross out another paragraph here, and then you take it back. And you take it back to the clerk and say, hey, sign on the dot line, you got a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, by the way, one person went to an all dealership with our uh, pre-printed car purchase agreement uh, from the consumer perspective, put it on the table after the person selected the car, and the dealer called the cops. <laughs> now, obviously, just going to Sears or Metropolitan or the big bank, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. But if we have facilities, if we have the tools of democracy for consumers, it would be, for example, an insert in the bank statement, the utility bill, the life insurance or auto insurance bill, uh, perhaps your motor vehicle registration envelope from your state government, uh, your tax form on your tax uh, envelope, and it would invite you to join a statewide group for whether you're interested in insurance reform uh, or banking or utilities or whatever. And if you wanted to join, you fill out the coupon, uh, $5 per uh, year, it's minimum dues, let's say. And all this money comes in, all the members elect the council directors, they hire full-time consumer champions and advocates and take on uh, the industry. We've never had a savings loan tobacco if we had this kind of uh, financial consumer association. This comes from Illinois, by the way, where a law was passed in the early uh, 80s requiring utilities to carry this, doesn't cost utilities anything, no extra postage, and this is paid for by the consumer group, 180,000 people joined in 18 months, and now it's 200,000 members, $1.2 million budget, it saved easily $4 billion in, a, in attempted rate hikes by electric telephone gas companies, including three years ago a $1.3 billion refund from Commonwealth Edison to families in Northern Illinois for overcharging them due to excessive electric generating capacity of their nuclear plants. <laughs> That's how you can stop losing ground. These are the facilities of democracy. You know, democracy is not just rights and remedies. Democracy has to be facilities. It has to be easy to band together, to get information, to mobilize for action. And the oligarchy, the concentrators of power, go out of their way to make it difficult for students to band together through referendums on campus and form public interest research groups. Washburn would be much bigger now if that, was a, if that freedom was available. They're using their own money to, to develop their own civic skills, their own civic education, and improve the state of Washington to vote. And the Board of Trustees, who are, who are part-time trustees and full-time corporate executives or corporate lawyers, are saying, no, we're not going to let you have this facility. Let's check off on the tuition bill after you have a referendum of students who want it. You know who's really great on facilities? The other side. Look at this one. When was the last time your children went to college and paid their tuition after the course was completed? <laughs> when was the last time you walked into a hotel and paid your bill after you finished your rest that evening, the next morning? It's all pay in advance. That's a wonderful facility. Of course, the government has a great facility too. It's called the withholding tax. But they don't want us to have our facilities. I once had lunch with the head of the IRS 
and said, look, uh, the taxpayers need to be organized. A way to organize them is uh, to have a, a square on the 1040 tax return, inviting them like this to join their own taxpayer watchdog group, so that if they don't like the way their billions of dollars go into corporate welfare instead of into public works to repair America and create good jobs, if they don't like the way their money goes into all of these bloated military contracts, like $6 million, Senator Mark Hatfield estimates, of your money every year goes to finance and subsidize the export of military arms by private companies. This isn't the Pentagon cutting deals with other countries to send them jets. Um, and all kinds of other giveaways. You're paying, some people are paying ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for Taxol, the anti-ovarian cancer drug synthesized from the U tree in the Northwest. That was developed by $31 million of government money, your money, using government scientists, National Institutes of Health, right down to the clinical test, ready to go. What do they do? The government gives it away under a monopoly marketing contract to Bristol Myers Squibb, no price restraint. They're charging ten to fifteen thousand dollars for a series of treatment. People can't pay it, they go on Medicaid, and the taxpayer pays it on Medicaid. Taxpayer paid to create. So I said to him, why don't you do this? It'll just make the government more humane, more efficient, and the money will be allocated to the nation's needs, not to the corporate's greed. So he pondered <laughs> for about a couple minutes, and he said, well, I have to oppose that. I, I, I said, why? I mean, it's so simple. You got some computers, you can add up the money, assign it to the nonprofit groups, controlled by the taxpayers, local, state, regional, national offices, etc. He said, I'm opposed to that. I said, why? And in one of the most memorable responses of a public servant that I've ever been privileged to hear, he said, quote, because it would um impose undue clutter on the tax forms. <laughs> Have you seen the tax forms? The guys? Now, in 1992, uh, I went up to New Hampshire during the frigid weather of the presidential primary and say, discussing the Concord Principles, as we call them, Concord, New Hampshire, is where they were released, just a few pages. They're on the Green Party web uh, site on the internet. And they were just what I'm talking about. The facilities, the tools to band together, to get information, and to become powerful as voters, taxpayers, citizens, consumers, workers, and investors savers. And the people loved it. And I, I said, well, if you like it and you want me to stand in as a non-candidate, none of the above. How's that for a hybrid? Uh, just to write me in. And I got 6,300 writing votes, which is pretty good in New Hampshire with a machine state, but that wasn't the most interesting part. I got 52% of the votes were Republican, 48% were Democrat, and that was the exact registration split in the state. What does that tell you? That tells you that the issues you're hearing today about the causes you're hearing described are majoritarian, majoritarian issues. They're majoritarian issues. You take polls on these issues, you debate these issues, you win. Issues, people, no matter who they are, they want safe cars. They want their money in the banks not looted. They want government that doesn't take their money and give it to some corporate criminal recidivist because that, that, that recidivist is putting money in the pockets of the politicians. They don't want $6 billion to send arms for, from private companies to dictatorships abroad, some of which will be used against our own military personnel. They want that money to, to strengthen that bridge, to build that transit system, to repair the school, to, to repair or construct the clinic. Uh, and when you deal with basic issues of power and democracy, when you deal with the tools of power, you transcend a lot of the superficial labels of consumer, conservative, liberal, this, that. And more and more people understand that the issue is we either have a government of the Exxons by the General Motors for the DuPonts, <laughs> or we have a government of the people by the people for the people. Throughout our history, we've gotten in trouble when there's been too much concentration of power and wealth in too few hands. We've seen it. Uh, 
Throwing out King George, there's too much concentration in the hands of British merchants and British imperial power. Uh, and the abolition of slavery. Uh, business was using slaves on plantations, <laughs> cotton and others. Um, indicating that business, when it's given too much power and it doesn't have to adhere to the proper rule of law and to strong and informed consumers, investors, workers, has no boundaries. The same companies that are operating on the Machila Doors across the border in Texas, toxifying, polluting, corrupting, exploiting their workers. These are blue chip corporations. Never dare do it here in this country. Why? Because of the rule of law, because we have a modest democracy in Mexico. It's a dictatorship oligarchy. Remember, it was General Motors and DuPont who uh, worked with I.G. Farber and Krupp in the Nazi regime that transcended national animosity. Remember, it's the companies today that are cutting deals with dictatorships all over the world uh, just so these dictatorships can repress their wages of the workers and keep the costs down of the multinationals under the new autocratic systems of government we call GATT and NAFTA. GATT and NAFTA, both Republican Dole, Clinton, Democrat, they supported GATT and NAFTA, clearly undermines our democracy, clearly puts an international system of autocratic government with secret courts, literally secret courts, under the World Trade Organization. And our higher living health and safety standards can be challenged as trade barriers to the imports of unsafe food or not so safe with motor vehicles or chemicals by other countries. And if they take us to Geneva, we've already lost to Mexico and uh, Tuna Dolphin and to Venezuela on reformulated gasoline and the pollution issue, uh, we're going to lose because the mandate of GAP is trade uber alles. It is trade over other health, safety, workplace, environmental considerations, all of which got to get on their knees and prove they're not restricting imports. GAP allows child labor, brutalized child labor, uh, to produce products in Asia and elsewhere and ship them to the United States. If we, we ban child labor here, if we add, add another law that bans the importation of products made by brutalized child labor, it would be GAP illegal. Indonesia or India or Pakistan could take us to the World Trade Organization's tribunals, which are secret, no independent appeal, and we'd lose. And that means we'd have to repeal our law or pay perpetual economic fines to the victorious country. Clinton, Dole, said okay to that. They said okay to the harmonization committees between countries that are secret, where never again we'll be allowed to be first, like with airbags or with any other safety, because we've got to go to harmonization committees with other companies, other countries. And the decisions are secret, we can't appeal them in our courts. We're doing it right now with Mexican trucks, U.S. trucks. Watch your rearview mirror in the next few years. The top weight for U.S. trucks is about 80,000 pounds by law. In Mexico, it's 175,000 pounds. Where do you think they're going to go? The trucking industry wants, in this country, wants heavier trucks. So the trucking industry in Mexico. So is the Mexican government. They're dealing in secret, not the Polko negotiating, and we are shut out. That's why we oppose GAP and NAFTA, among other reasons. But let's start, start talking about the things that unite us, because progressives have emphasized, and properly so, <coughs> discriminatory injustice, racial injustice, ethnic injustice, gender injustice, etc. There's not enough emphasis on indiscriminate injustice, the kind of injustice from the power structure that inflicts this injustice on every people, regardless of the race, color, creed, religion, or gender. Now, corporations are very good about shafting us regardless of our various <laughs> Once we get these kinds of indiscriminate injustice issues on the public agenda, then we're going to have something that binds us all. If we just focus on discriminatory injustice, and there's plenty of that to go around, we, without indiscriminate injustice, we're going to be vulnerable to divide and rule tactics by the power structure, as you've seen. So throughout our history, women's right to vote, six women, met in 1846 in a farmhouse in Seneca Falls, New York, to start the national drive for women's right to vote. It wasn't just many men who opposed that. It was businesses who didn't want women coming in against child labor and other practices. Well, it was pretty lonely, wasn't it? Just that for those six women, 
to start that. And then they fanned out across the country, multiplied their numbers. They were beaten, they were arrested, they were dragged off to jail. They had dirty hot water thrown at them from the second story of a house when they were canvassing in Kansas, etc. And it wasn't the abolitionist fight pretty long ago. And how about the workers in the sit-down strikes up against the big industrialists and their detective goons? Uh, that was pretty lonely too. And Flint, Michigan, and the steel industry, and in the coal mine industry. That was pretty lonely. I was up against big eyes. They didn't have telephones or fax machines uh, or the internet or any of that. It was very, very lonely. And they, all these people took on these odds. They believed in the justice of their cause. And they sacrificed a great deal, and they prevailed, and the country's better as a result. And in the 20th century, the civil rights, environmental rights, women's rights, dis disabled people's rights. I, I never, when I went to school, I never saw a disabled student. They weren't allowed to go to school. It was too inconvenient. There were no access uh, ramps. So they were shoved aside, out of sight, out of mind. And then they revolted, and they sat in government offices, and they wrote, and they testified in their wheelchairs, on their crutches, and they basically said, get off our back. We want to be in, in the mainstream of activity in America, etc. Stop patronizing us. And look at isn't the country better off as a result? That's what democracy is. <laughs> now we come to the present, November 5th, all right? We have some of the dreariest and narrowest political look-alike choices <laughs> imaginable. And people still are saying to themselves, well, I, I'm just not going to vote. I've been voted for 15, 20 years. They're not going to drag me to the polls. Uh, politics is corrupt. Money corrupts. Well, for those people, don't we all have a good, a good alternative? Yeah. Okay. To make the point, I'm not accepting any money at all. No contributions whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> Secondly, we're going to see the breakup of the two-party duopoly. It's already tottering. It's hollow. The two parties have no mass base. They just can raise tons of money and hurl 30-second electronic ads of meaningless images against one another. <laughs> Do you know sometimes that you see uh, structures that appear impregnable, and but they're hollowing out, they're quietly decaying, and then you give them a push, and they collapse. <laughs> What's saving this two-party duopoly is one, uh, they pass laws that make it very hard for new political starts, make it very hard for uh, third parties, they exclude them from debates, they require all kinds of petitioning hurdles to get people on compared to Canada and Western Europe. Uh, but that's going to be a thing of the past. That's going to be overcome. In the year 2000, you're going to see candidates fielded by the Labour Party, which has a, a desk out there. And the, Labour Party, the Labour Party was formed by real, authentic people in the union movement. Uh, Tony Mazzocchi leading them, going all over the country year after year, talking with 200, 300, 100, Tennessee, Mississippi, Michigan, Wisconsin, California, etc. And it had a huge convention in late June with 1,500 delegates from 45 states. It was blacked out by the national media. At least I got the editor of the New York Times to admit that was a mistake and he shouldn't have done it. Uh, it, was, it was big news in Cleveland, though. Big, big news. Page one, uh, several days. Uh, going, uh, and they didn't field any candidates because they weren't ready this year. They'll be ready in the year 2000, and the AFL-CIO will not be able to get on its knees in front of George Ronald Clinton and Al Gore and pump $35 million into the Democrat campaigns and get no pro-labor agenda in return. Then there are people in this audience who have their own great causes. One of them is to get back some of the land grants to the giant railroads. And here's the book, Railroads and Clear Cut. 
Huge amounts of land were given to the railroads in the 19th century to build railroads. The trouble is they gave too much land. Now the railroads are using the land to cut the timber, to have recreational uh, centers, etc., etc. It's not their land. It was only given on condition that it be used for railroad purposes. And uh, George uh, Dra Drafen, is he here? Are you here? You want to talk to him about it? It's going to be a very interesting movement. It's going to deal with corporate chartering, and it's going to deal with uh, holding these railroads to their legal commitments. The Green Party here. In, um, in the state of Washington, was very, very energetic in putting me uh, on the ballot with citizen volunteers, uh, getting the petitions. I'm on the ballot now in 21 states plus the District of Columbia. I would get these petitions and notices from the Secretary of State, and I'd have to sign and notarize it, and it kept going five states, 10, 15, 20. They almost got another 10 states. What's this election about? The election, first and foremost, is about the extent of the energy of citizens who've had enough and want to build a progressive and just society. That's the key, the energy. Uh, a a society is like a fish. It rots from the head down. It's got to be rebuilt. Our society's got to be rebuilt from the bottom up. There's no guy on the horse. None of this can come from the top because even if you have the best person in the world uh, go to Congress or go to uh, the White House, they can't deliver. The, the, the power lock of the corporate uh, institutions are, are far too overwhelming. It has to be built uh, from the bottom. So you might want to ask yourself, in the next two weeks, do you know 100 people who qualify as workers, co-workers, friends, relatives and neighbors, people you've spoken with, you've played with, you've studied with, you've worked with, you've argued with, uh, people who you can persuade not to throw their vote away uh, by voting for Mr. Clinton or Mr. Dole. That's really throwing their vote away. Uh, it just perpetuates business as usual, corruption as usual, trivialization of our national issues as usual. and the concentration of power more and more, not only in fewer hands, but even in fewer hands outside our national jurisdiction, where they can pick one country against another uh, and drive us down to lower standards of living. We've got big problems coming up, environmental problems in the 21st century. We've got artificial intelligence and the uh, replacement of jobs by automation, computerization, outsourcing, white and blue collar jobs abroad. Uh, we're moving toward a pool of labor of four billion people, many of which will work for two, three dollars a day, hard with modern equipment. Uh, capital is so mobile now, and labor isn't. So capital can move around the world with these multinationals, but labor cannot. Have you ever seen a, a, a group of workers say to, to the U.S. government, you know, if you don't double our wages and give us a tax break and give us a subsidy, we're going to quit the country. <laughs> That's what corporations do. Corporations are not like you and me. They are privileged, artificial legal entities who are given all the rights under the Constitution that we have, except one or two, like privileged against the community. And they have no business being given all the rights that we have, plus privileges and immunities that we could never have because we're not artificial legal entities. Can you create your own parent? Can you be in 20 places at once? Can you transfer costs on you to someone else with such ease? Can you obscure your responsibility the way executives do in corporations? And you can't have equal justice under the law. When you have an equality of corporate rights and human rights, plus an inequality of corporate privileges and immunities from liability and from wrongful damage to innocent people, uh, and it doesn't occur on the other side. Indeed, we really have to ask ourselves, uh, in any society that presumes to have equal justice as a des desired goal, that whenever there's a collision between human rights and corporate rights, human rights have to be supreme. They have to be supreme.
All right, now it comes down to the energy level. All right, let's see. How many people here are already or about to be or plan to be leaders in the advancement of justice in our country and world as you see it? Leaders. How many people have just decided that they're just going to be followers? You know, you have your weekends off, it's pretty nice. <laughs> Don't have to go to many committee meetings. Uh, it's a, not too many. That means the majority of you still have this subject under contemplation. <laughs> the country is starved for leadership, not just political. Business station leadership, the graphic arts and leadership, the cultural leadership, and and student leadership, and educational leadership, and, and labor leadership. There are all these openings. What are you waiting for? This is supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave, right? Here we are with all this 23% child poverty, and homelessness, and slums, and hovels, and rural poverty, and uh, inadequate health care, and shaky job security and looted pensions and so on. 1996. It's 1996. Modern wealth, technology, communications, capability. Why aren't we solving our problems? Because we've given up too much of our power and our control to too few corporations who control government. So we've got to turn around. It's turned around by leadership. Remember, John Adams once said, our second president, 200 years ago. So he said, you know. Our generation is composed of politicians and statesmen so that our children can become physicians and scientists, so that their children can become musicians and artists. How far we are from <coughs> build a political, progressive, political force now and in future elections so that never again will the corporate Democrats say to millions of Americans they have nowhere to go other than stay home or to choose the Democrats because they're not quite as bad as the Republicans. A choice between the bad and the worst which ensures that both get worse every four years instead of a choice between the good and the better. And one of the reforms that should be on a referendum ballot here in the state of Washington is a binding none of the above provision yes. next to every, every candidate. <laughs> so that when we get Tweedledum, Tweedledee, corrupt, trivialized politicians on the ballot, now our only option is stay home, which is what they love us to do, drop out from democracy. With binding none of the above, we can vote for none of the above, if none of the above gets the most votes, it cancels the election, sends the candidates packing, and orders new elections with new candidates in 30 minutes. How many of you would like to see that on the ballot in Washington State in two years? Everything starts with a sign-up sheet. Can someone take the responsibility out there to have a sign-up sheet, none of the above, 1998, and sign your name and address and telephone number. If you want to take an active role, circle your name, and you're underway. 1,000 active, organized, connected citizens in the state of Washington can transform the entire political scene here. Expand your epicenter of at least a hundred friends, co-workers, relatives, neighbors. So when you meet each other to check your progress in building democracy and solving problems instead of creating them through the political corporate system, you can say, ask one another, oh, ho, how's your epicenter? How's your epicenter? Well, it's up to 70, it's up to 90, it's really superior quality, and you can't believe the energy level. And then you put it all together, and nothing, nothing can stop the organized power of the people.
The greatest power the corporations have is their belief that millions of people have given up on themselves, have said they don't count, have said they can't fight the power structure, and have basically dropped out of democracy. Once you deny them that power, they will start behaving. They will either start behaving or they will be prosecuted or they will be displaced or they will shrink or they will have to shape up. That's the central factor of citizen energy. That's where it really comes down to. When all is said and done and the applause is over and people drift away, the question is, to what do they drift away to? A resolved, dedicated, committed determination to forge the muscle of a progressive and humane democracy that's held up to the world as an example? Or do they drift away to their regular routines, saying they just don't have time, they just are too busy, they are just trying to get through the day? Well, you're going to have more trouble getting through the day and you're going to have more grievances and more injustices if you only live a private citizen's life and don't dedicate yourself to the public citizen's life to which you are enabled by our Constitution and our judicial traditions. The Green Party, the Green Party candidacy, of which I'm on the ballot here in Washington State. Ne Okay. <laughs> That's only because of the technicality. In, in spirit and metaphor, it's the Green Party. But on the ballot, it will be an independent designation. Um, the, the, real, the real dialogue in the next two weeks is to ask people, what do they want to vote to? Just more of the same, or they want a fresh start? Do they want to build something different, something that will hold up an alternative to the corrupt process and either shape it up or displace it in future years? Our political system is so exclusive and so concentrated in its duopoly that it, in nature it would not allow an acorn to become an oak tree, and in the marketplace, if it had the same practices of exclusion, our political duopoly would be indicted for criminal violation of the antitrust laws. So we really have to spread the dialogue uh, and urge people to think about what their vote uh, is, is, is expected to mean by their own experience and their own frustration of every four years and every two years getting promises that are broken and, and uh, getting politicians who turn their back on the people. So I'll leave you with just one uh, one exhortation, and that is that the reason why I accepted the invitation of various Green Party and independent uh, initiatives to put me on the ballot is because in the last 15 years I have seen an increasing closeout of the citizens from their own government in Washington because of the influence and domination of corporate interests. And when citizens don't have a chance to have a chance to participate in government policy, whether it's the Congress, the executive branch agencies, or the courts, there's no alternative but to go into the electoral arena and change the conditions from an oligopoly plutocratic system to a functioning democracy. The secret of democracy is that it works, and when a society's in trouble, we need not less democracy, more democracy, and big business is on a collision course with American democracy, and American democracy is losing, and millions of people are losing along with it. The resolution of dedicated citizens makes all the difference. And that's why I think the slogan of our movement should be what it was at the Green Party Convention in Los Angeles, which is go, we, go. 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 Go we go, 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 on the way into November 5th and beyond. Thank you very much.
unfortunately, everybody's on a crowded schedule. We have a few uh, questions, comments, or announcements, uh, uh, and then you've got the rest of your schedule. I understand these kinds of meetings are going on all over the country, right? On uh, corporations, democracy. This is all connected. Yeah. Yeah. That change is right now. Yes, you see, uh, we're a fossil fuel nuclear energy. So the question is, uh, talk about a little about solar energy and replacing the, the seven big oil companies and other fossil fuel nuclear. Uh, solar energy has been around for over 2,000 years in terms of solar architecture. It was used by the ancient Greeks and Persians in terms of their building structures. Uh, windmills have been around a long time, but much more modern. Photovoltaic prices are dropping. The U.S. Navy is buying 20,000 photovoltaic installations because of economy instead of gas turbines. And um, solar water heating was on in the 20s on roofs all over southern Florida. Uh, it, it is really uh, ready to go, but it, it, it's up against an uneven playing field in terms of financing disadvantages, in terms of government subsidies that still go to nuclear and fossil. So we've got to make this a major a uh, major issue. The solar energy comes closest to being a universal solvent. It solves so many problems. Future generation problems, environmental problems, embargo, geopolitical entanglements, and above all, it's a very stable and a steady source of energy for the next four billion years if you're into long-range planning. And it has one other quality. No matter how strong the exons of the world get, they will never be able to eclipse the sun and produce an embargo. oligarchy and then try to turn it into a national security issue and, and move to squelch uh, even more or to dismantle even more our democratic uh, levers and rights. Well, they could do that when the Soviet Union was the big bugaboo. They've lost the red baby option, as they say, in Washington. And uh, I don't think they would have a chance to try to uh, cut the people's rights off of the past, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. Yes. First of all, it was on 60 Minutes twice. This is the GM trolley tearing out the trolleys. It was on 60 Minutes twice. There's a detailed report from the Senate Antitrust Monopoly Subcommittee around 1974. That's in your library that gets all the congressional reports. And there's a new book coming out in two years that's going to be a wing dinger on this and other things involving GM. Just one more question, please. I'm sorry, we got it. Yes, go ahead. Can you say something about the recent scandal that's coming out about the CIA yeah. smuggling all the uh, dope to the blood and the crypts? And uh, you know, I wanted to say that the you know, CIA is definitely a form of corporate welfare also. They're the secret police who keep the uh, uh, global corporate domination going. And uh, you know, it's definitely, I think it's a uh, collegial... Yeah. Well, what, what the intelligence agencies, they like to call themselves, uh, have a record have the record budget, have a record budget. No more Soviet Union, we're trading everything with China and so on. And uh, I don't know, what, why do they have a record budget more than they have in the Soviet Union is operating? I mean, are they really concerned about Moldova or Inner Mongolia or Lithuania? And because they have more money and they know what to do with it, they're going into closer collaboration with multinationals, trying to counteract corporate espionage from the French and so forth. And where do you think that's going to lead? That doesn't have any discernible boundaries. So that's just a, another example of the gross misallocation of the federal budget from the real needs of our country. Just one more up here. Yeah. Who? Yeah. Who was it then? I Okay.
You need other simple questions? <laughs> One, now I am against the police state. That's a pretty surprising. <laughs> We, we need to have much more grassroots civil liberties uh, activity. In Idaho, there isn't a, one, a single cooperating lawyer with the American Civil Liberties Union, for example. I'm just, uh, so the second, in the public schools, that's a long subject, of course, but uh, the mobilization of the neighbor, neighborhoods and uh, the parents and the teachers, there are enough examples of great inner school, public schools, uh, to show that there are ways to do it. And the idea of abandoning the public schools where over 90% of the children go for basically corporatized education, and the corporations see this as a potential $350 billion takeover industry, uh, is not to my liking at all. I'm sorry. Thank you very much.